So hello everyone and welcome to Hillham Church uh, online service and we welcome you and your family to join with us. I know it's unusual to have church in this way but uh, unusual times call for unusual measures and so we're thankful for the technology that we have to be able to do church like this and we're going to continue to to have church the way we always have church just not in the building. We're going to have a call to worship. We're going to have special music. We're going to have uh, a time where you're able to give, not here in the church, but you are able to uh, send your tithes and your offerings to uh, the church. Um, you can use our online platform to give in that way. We're also going to have a message for you, but first we want to uh, just have a a time of prayer, and then special music. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We just want to glorify you in everything that we do and say. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our call to worship this morning is from Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on the things on the earth. On a hill far away Stood an old rugged cross The emblem of suffering and shame And I love that old cross Where the dearest and best For a world of lost sinners was slain So I'll cherish Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown To the old rugged cross I will ever be true It's shame and reproach gladly bear Then he'll call me someday To my home far away Where his glory forever I'll share And I'll cherish the old rugged cross Tell my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday Pray for answers 
But the answers never come For every tear That you cry There's a promise He will make your burdens lie Come and lay your burdens down To the place where freedom is found At the feet, at the feet of Jesus Come and lay your burdens And there's a lot of things that go along with that. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have some people who, when they say, are you canceling church, and they find out the answer to that, their response, even some of you today, you're at home, maybe you're in your pajamas, you have you a cup of coffee, and you're thinking, wow, I could get used to having church this way, Right? So just don't get too used to having church this way. We're going to do this for a little while, but we look forward to the time when we're able to come back as a faith family and worship to God, worship God together. And so uh, we are thankful to God for the technology that He's given us to be able to have church this way, even though we're not physically in the church. We are still the church, and you are still the church. And so you really can't cancel church. God's people continues to pray and to worship and to lift God's name on high. And so I do think that I need to make a point that this decision to, to not have church in the normal way that we typically have church, it's, it's not a decision that was born out of fear, Instead, we believe that really it's the wisest thing that we could do given the circumstances. We want to be a part of preventing um, this, this spread. We want to be a part of helping slow down the threat of this virus. We also believe that this decision uh, to have church online is a compassionate one. 
We want to protect those in our community, and we want to protect those in our faith family who might be at a higher risk. We also want to honor our government by not meeting in groups of more than ten people. Now, we don't want to be a people of God who are gripped by fear and anxiety, and we don't want to be caught up in, in all of that. There's kind of enough of, of, of the panic that's going around, right? I mean, you see people going out and they're buying lifetime supply of toilet paper and hand sanitizer. And so we don't want to be a people who are gripped by fear and anxiety. Instead, we want to be a people of peace. And we want to remind people and everywhere around us that, that God is still in control. In times of uncertainty, Jesus is the anchor for your hope. He promises to be your comforter, your provider. He promises to be your shield. He promises to be your help with anything that comes your way. He tells us to cast all of our worries and all of our fears on Him because he cares. And so right now, Jesus can be your shield. Right now, Jesus can be your unshakable peace. So, here's kind of the deal. We, as the church, we're still the church. You can't cancel church. And even though we're not all together in the church building, right where you are, wherever that is, you are the church. Because if you think about the definition of the church, the church is, is not the building. Yeah, we go to the building and we say, hey, we're going down to church, right? But church is not the building. Uh, church is not the service, although, you know, we sometimes say that, that we talk about the music and the message and the prayer time. But church is not the building. It's not the service. Church has always been the people Actually, the biblical meaning of church is the called out ones, right? The, the, the people who are called out. You're called out from darkness. You're called out from death. You're called out from hopelessness. And you're called into a life of Christ. You're called into a new life. You're called into uh, a life where uh, God is going before you and you're following. You go from death to life. And so, you, right where you are, you are the church. When this virus is over, and it will pass, right? Just as Grandma Lois says, this too shall pass. And, and this, will be, this will pass. And I believe that you know, when we come back together in the church building, having a normal church service, that we will be strengthened, that uh, our faith will continue to grow, and I do believe that we'll be more encouraged than ever before. And I look forward to that. I do look forward to us uh, getting back together, as we have uh, always in the past been able to do. Uh, in fact, um, the Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25 says, Not giving up meeting together, so we don't give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. So I do look forward to the day when we're able to come back and worship. Today I want to give you four responses to what it means um, to be the church. What do people in the world need to see you doing as the church? So, so four responses on what you should do at this time. Number one, you should remain at peace. Remain at peace. I believe that your life and the life of your family should be characterized by peace. Just last week, we looked at this scripture from from Jesus in John chapter 14. And Jesus says in John chapter 14, beginning at verse 27, He says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. So do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. 
Jesus here, he was speaking these words to his disciples, really, during a world crisis. I mean, the Savior is about to lay down his life. And so his disciples had plenty of reasons to be troubled, to be fearful, and yet Jesus says here, in the midst of the crazy, in the midst of the turmoil, I'm giving you a gift. I'm giving you the gift of peace, and I want you to receive it. And so, you can have peace, disciples. You can have peace, Christians. You can have peace, followers of Christ. You can have peace, Hillham Faith family. Jesus says just to receive the gift that he has given you. Even when things are awful and terrible on the outside, you can have peace on the inside. Most of the times we get that a little backwards. We think that so long as everything on the outside is going fine, then the hope is because things are going okay on the outside, then that's going to give me peace on the inside if I have plenty of money in the bank. If my health is going good, if my, you know, I've got a lot of friends, my marriage is going good, um, the people who get on my nerves are kind of out of my life right now. Everything's going good on the outside, and so we think that that brings peace on the inside, but Jesus says that that's not the way it is. He says there in John 14 that I give you my peace. The peace of Jesus starts on the inside. No matter what's going on externally, things can fall apart, things can go sideways, things can disappoint us and not turn out the way we want, but we can still have that peace that passes all understanding because we have the peace of Christ on the inside. His peace is internal and it works and it flows to the outside. I think that's why it's so important that we don't put our hope on those things that are external. Because so many times those things fail us. I mean, you just look at the world of sports, right? And uh, those of you who know me, you know that I enjoy sports. But every major sporting event has been canceled. The NBA has been canceled. The NCAA. Major League Baseball has been canceled. And of course, you know, for me, I haven't put my hope in a baseball team for at least 30 years, right? Being a Reds fan, it's just been tough. But the Masters, the Masters has been canceled. And so all of these big sporting events, everything has been canceled. I heard one guy say, he said, you know what? I'm going to take this virus thing serious once they cancel my eight-year-old's travel team tournament, right? Well, guess what? They canceled it, and uh, that's big news. That's big news because things like this just usually don't happen. They just never happen. I mean, you're not able to watch games. You're not able to play any games. You're not able to scroll on your phone and catch scores. You're not able to bet on games, which is a good thing. But you're not able to do any of these things in the sports world, and... It makes us pause, and it makes us think what really is important. What is it in our lives that really matter? What is it that we can anchor our hope to? I heard a, 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 a tweet. I saw a tweet from an NBA player this week. He said, Baseball, uh, basketball is not who you are. It's just a game that you play. So... We really need to figure out what is important in our life. I thought about a time uh, in the Bible, uh, Jesus and his disciples were uh, going across the, the Sea of Galilee. They were all in the boat. You may remember this, uh, this story. And as they were going across the Sea of Galilee, a storm just, just popped up. Unannounced, unscheduled, didn't know it was going to happen, right? And uh, Jesus was in the bottom of the boat asleep. And these grown fishermen, uh, the Bible says, were afraid for their lives. And they were scared. And they decided that they were going to wake Jesus up. 
And that's what they always would do, right? When, when the disciples had a problem, when they had a question, Jesus was their answer guy. Jesus was their go-to guy. And so that they decide to wake Jesus up during this storm. And this is what the Bible tells us. Mark chapter 4, verse 38 it says, Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion, and the disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? And Jesus got up, and he rebuked the wind, and he said to the waves, Peace, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm, and he said to his disciples, Why? Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? I believe here Jesus is modeling for us how to have peace and how to stay calm in the midst of such fear and anxiety. You think about that story there. Do you think Jesus was rattled by that storm? No, he was not. He was in control. And I think about that now in the situation that we find ourselves. Do you think that Jesus now, with everything that's going on, do you think that Jesus is rattled? No, he is not. He is in control. It's a peace that passes all understanding when we're anchored to Christ. And so we don't put our hope in the sporting world. We don't put our hope in money. You just look at the stock market now. No, don't look at the stock market now. It'll put you in a panic attack, right? We don't put our hope in our health. None of us are getting any younger. And, um, you know, I'm all for eating healthy and exercising and trying to keep our body as fit and in shape as we can. But we can't put our hope in our health. Um, I mean, just look at what's happening. This more than any, anything should, should help us to see how frail and how fragile our bodies really are. And so Jesus says, put your hope in something that's going to last. Take my peace. It's a peace that passes all understanding no matter what's going around, on around you. You can have peace. So remain at peace, as the song and the saying goes, we don't know what the future holds, but we know who holds the future. The second thing I think that we should do as the church, you as the church right now, is you should act with wisdom. We should act with wisdom. We have faith, right? We have faith in God, but we also have wisdom. God tells us, you know, if, if you want to be wise, if you want some wisdom, if you want some godly wisdom, all you have to do is ask, and God's promise is that He will provide you with wisdom. James chapter 1, verse 5 says, And if any of you lack wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Another promise of God. He's going to provide you with peace. He's also going to provide you with the wisdom that you need to live. And so we have, we have both faith and we have wisdom. And I don't believe that somehow faith cancels out that wisdom that God gives us. In other words, I don't believe that... Uh, you, you, I don't say, okay, God, I, I know that you protect me. I know that you shield me. So because of that, I'm just going to go act a fool. And I'm going to do some foolish things, whatever I want to do, and I know that you've got me covered. No, that doesn't work that way. We don't test God. We don't try God. That's why I said before, my kids are driving and I tell them, be smart, be wise, be cautious. You know, stay behind the wheel. Of the car. Don't get up on the hood and try to serve. Be smart. Don't act foolish. Faith doesn't mean that, uh, that you can act foolish. And just as faith doesn't cancel out wisdom, wisdom doesn't cancel out faith. You don't get to the point where you become so wise. Um, you know, I'm so smart. I know a lot of things. I have a lot 
lot of wisdom, and so now I don't need to lean on God. I don't need to ask God questions. I don't need help from God. I've become so wise. We don't get to a point in our life where we're there. We need faith, and we need wisdom. And I think today, right where we are, in the situation that we find ourselves, we need to have a faith that acts wisely. And so we get to come to God and just ask God for help. God, help me. Help me to live a wise life. Help me to just, when choices and decisions come, help me to just call upon you. God, what is the wisest thing for me to do? And God promises to give you that wisdom. The Bible contains what we call a wisdom literature. And so we have a couple books in the Bible while you have some time on your hands, nobody's going to be watching March Madness, and so you have some time on your hands, uh, the book of Proverbs and the book of Ecclesiastes is what we call the wisdom literature in the Bible, and so take time and read through there and just ask God, God, help me to live as wise as I possibly can. And right now, I say practically, you know, how is it that we should live wise? I would say, you know, do the things that people are, are telling you to do. The people who are a lot smarter than me, just, you know, keep clean, stay healthy, uh, stay away from great big, you know, groups of people. If you're sick, stay home, don't go to grandma's house, do all of these things that will keep you healthy. God, help us to live wisely. The third thing that I want to encourage you to do is to demonstrate love, and compassion. You know, what is it that you should do? Demonstrate love and compassion to those people around you. You know, God's love in our life is just, I mean, it's powerful, right? I mean, love is what makes the world go around. That's a, it's the power of love, right? Makes one man weep, makes a, another man sing, right? That's, that's for all the, the 80s people out there with the Huey Lewis, but love changes things. Love is able to do so much and change hearts, change relationships, change a person's life just by sharing love and compassion to somebody else. You know, it's springtime now and it's just love is in the air. There's Things are starting to get green, the sun's been popping out, flowers has been uh, uh, coming up and just something about the springtime, right? It's just love is in the air. Something about the springtime that makes teenagers' heads just kind of spin around. I don't know what that is, but the springtime, right? I, uh, my, two, my two youngest boys, age six and age nine, just this week in the bathroom on the step stool, splashing cologne on their face, right? So love is in the air. Love changes things. It has the ability to just really soften hearts and change attitudes. And so while you are the church, look for ways where you can demonstrate love, where you can show some compassion and be there for somebody who needs Love and compassion. Love and compassion for one another is able to change all kinds of things, and so we do want to be um, a people of God who make some sacrifices, right? I mean, we go out of our way to show love and compassion. Don't be like the guy I've talked about before and says, hey man, Whatever you need, I'll be there, whatever it takes, so long as it doesn't take any of my time and any of my money, I'll be there for you, right? No, we sacrifice sometimes to show love and to show compassion to other people. We're different. And I've told the story before about, you know, as a pastor, sometimes a family will call me and ask me to come over for for a time of prayer when uh, a loved one just uh, doesn't have very long to live. And it wasn't too long ago I was called to a home where this, uh, this older man was uh, 
was dying. He knew he just had a few hours to live. He had lived a long, good life, and he was surrounded by friends and family in his living room, and he was sitting in a recliner, and the family said, you know, would you just have a closing prayer with us? We know he just has a few hours left to live. And so I went over to this dad, this grandpa, and I asked him, I said, how do you want me to pray? What do you want me to say? And he said, you know, in, in, this, in his final hours, he said, I want you to pray that these people that I love and who love me, would you just pray that they would love God and would you pray that they would love one another? That they would get rid of all their petty disagreements and their arguments, who has this, who doesn't have that, and would you just pray that they would love one another? Love changes things. The greatest love that has ever been demonstrated is the love of God for you. The Bible says that God loves you even while you were yet sinner, right? Christ died for you. And sometimes it's hard for us to understand that God loves, right? loves little old you, loves little old me. And we have a hard time sometimes thinking, wow, God really does love me. And the thing about that is you have a hard time believing that sometimes you may have a hard time understanding that because you know you know your own stuff right you know all the times you disappointed god you know all the times that you let god down and yet the bible says through and through that god loves you right where you are and in fact if you ever wonder how much jesus loves you jesus says i love you from here to here if you ever wonder how much Jesus loves you, all you have to do is look at the cross. Jesus laid down his life for you because he loves you. The last thing I wanted to mention is, you know, how are we supposed to be the church when we're not in the church building? What are we supposed to do? What is it? We're to be devoted to prayer. We're to be a praying people Prayerful people or peaceful people, you're wise, you're loving, and you're compassionate. The Bible tells us over and over and over that prayer changes things, that we serve a God who continues to go before us, and we serve a God who answers prayer. And so we continue to pray, we continue to pray for the things that we've always prayed about, right? Uh, Pray for souls to be one, lives changed, families restored, kids and teens loving Jesus. We pray for all of those things, but at this time, we also pray for some additional things. We pray for the leaders of our country, right? We need to pray for the leaders of our nation. We need humility. We need people working together. We need wisdom. I'd ask that uh, as you go to, to, to pray, that you remember our local leaders. Pray that they would seek God's wisdom. Pray for all the supervisors. Pray for the school administration, school officials. Continue to lift those people up. We need to remember uh, families in our community who are fearful, who are uncertain, that they would be comforted and strengthened and encouraged. We need to continue to lift up our health care people, doctors and nurses, those in hospitals and nursing homes, that, that, uh, that God would use them, right? God's able to, he's able to heal, he's able to cure, he's able to do all of this stuff, but many times God uses people to do some amazing things. And so let's remember those people. Let us pray that uh, through all of this, and everything that we do, right where you are, that God would always be glorified. That we would lift his name up on high. And so we just ask God to give us the tools and the resources that we need to do his will and to lift his name up on high. A passage of scripture, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14 says this, If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin 
and I will heal their land. That's what we need. We need healing, right? We need healing. And so I just pray that we're able to come together as people of God, as a faith family, and just continue to be devoted in prayer. And so, just join with me. I know it's a, it's a little different the way we're, we're doing church today, but if you have a chance, an opportunity, to just get your family to, to, together and pray about these things. Or maybe you're uh, on a phone or on a, in front of a TV or a computer screen. You can just pray right where you are. But just join with us and let's go to the Lord in prayer. We serve an awesome God who's in control and he wants us to have peace and he still wants us to be the church wherever you are. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you in advance for your answers to prayer. We love you and we thank you that you're so far ahead of us and you're clearing the way for us. Father God, we do thank you for your hedge of protection and your shield. Your word says that the angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear you. And so we just stand in awe and we stand in reverence of you and just thank you and praise you. Father God, we just ask that you bless every, everyone who's listening, everyone who is a part of, uh, of doing your will, that you would continue to guide, guard, and direct. Father, we love you. We ask it in Jesus' name, where your word says that one day, just at the mention of the name of, name of Jesus, that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord, and that there's no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. It's only the name of Jesus, and so we ask it in his mighty name. Amen.